2024 is the year of pursuit. 2024 is the year of pursuit. And at the heart of this vision is one statement. Listen to this. No pause exists in the pursuit of God. No pause exists in the pursuit of God. Now, I want to ask you a question. As I say that statement, I want to ask you what you hear. What do you think that statement means? No pause exists in the pursuit of God. Because here's my assumption, all right? I assume that 90 to 98% of you don't lie when I follow up with you. Be like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. I I believe 90 to 98% of you think about our pursuit of God. And this is our hope and our desire, that no pause would exist in our pursuit of God. But there are Two ways to hear this statement. No pause exists in the pursuit of God. When it comes to God's love, when it comes to God's grace, when it comes to God's resolve to run after us and to chase us down, Here is one mind-blowing, heart-exploding truth. No pause exists in the pursuit of God. And this, friends, is all over the Bible. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, I have loved you, God says, with an everlasting love. Psalm 23, verse 6 tells us that God's goodness and mercy follow us, how long? All the days of our life. And then we could go to the New Testament where Jesus is talking about the Father's love for all people, not just the ones that seem super religious, but but the ones that we think are super not. And he says that the Heavenly Father is the kind of shepherd that would leave 99 safe sheep to go after the one who is lost. There is no pause in the pursuit of God. So it's my prayer today. And my prayer, it's been my prayer all week. God gave me these words this week to pray, and it's my prayer today. It's gonna continue to be my prayer all 366 days, minus about 11, because that's when God gave me these words last week, all right? Here you go. That we would live with an unshakable conviction. We're convinced, we really believe that there's no, God, no pause that exists in the pursuit of God after us. And then in response, that we would live with an unyielding commitment in our pursuit of him. This is our vision, and this is what we see in Psalm chapter 27. I hope you'll turn there, turn on your app, and follow along as I read these words for us. We come to the words of King David. King David was Israel's greatest king. And the reason he was Israel's greatest king is because, as the book of Acts would tell us later, that David is described as a man after God's own heart. And his words here capture the heart of our 2024 vision. I want to read these first eight verses for us. David writes this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil doers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. 
one thing I have asked of the Lord. That I will seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. And I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. I have two truths to give you this morning that go together, and you're going to see how they do that in just a bit, all right? The first one is this, and it's an encouragement for us as we lean into this vision. Let's make pursuing God our greatest passion. Let's make pursuing God our greatest passion. I want to ask you to measure your passion against the words of Psalm 27, verse 4. And it, and it helps to just kind of be honest with yourself because uh, you're not fooling God for sure, and you're probably not fooling the people around you either, but most of all, don't fool yourself. Let's be honest. Let's measure our hearts against these words. What we see is David has a supreme passion, okay? He has one ultimate desire, one great pursuit. He says, one thing have I asked God. I mean, if you could ask God anything, if you could ask God for anything, what would you ask him? David's answer is, I want to seek you, God. I want to to live in such a way that you are my greatest priority. You see, our greatest passion gets our greatest attention, affection, and adoration. And if you want a simplified version of that, you can just say our time, our love, and our worship. This is what a heart passionate for God looks like. Like and, and listen, we need to pause, and I just want to put out there that we all understand there are so many valuable passions in life. There are so many good pursuits. There are so many gifts from God that we chase after that are not necessarily bad, not at all. We think about our family and friendships. We think about school, work, and the ways that we serve others. We think about the pursuit of knowledge, success, and financial security. These aren't bad pursuits. Even the the pursuit of our hobbies like music and sports and entertainment and travel. Listen, these can be good pursuits. But what David is saying is all other pursuits in our lives get caught up in this one pursuit. That all other pursuits are, wow, defined by this one pursuit. And so to put this in very practical terms, listen, I am am not just a husband. I'm, I'm not just a dad. I'm not just someone who does a job. I'm not just someone who likes to sip some coffee at the thousand great coffee shops around Boston. Okay, I am a Christian husband, a Christian father, a Christian servant. Jesus defines everything about me. I hope you can say the same because, listen, all other pursuits, however good they may be, they must bow down to this one great pursuit. David's heart had a singular focus. And then he says, uh, one thing I ask, this is what I seek after. To seek is to go after. It is to chase. It is to relentlessly pursue. 
And I'm curious what you think about when you hear the word pursuit. Perhaps you think about the pursuit of a dream. God puts dreams in our heart. We go after them with everything we've got. Maybe you're thinking about how companies pursue the bottom line, profits and those profit margins. And Maybe you think about a security guard chasing down a thief. Or you think about a leopard pursuing its prey. How about the pursuit of your spouse? Anyone? Hopefully, some, somebody hopefully thought of that in here this morning. Okay, you, can, you can go ahead and grab that hand this morning. Okay, it's, it's okay. You can do that. All right? That would be a good move right now. And by the way, keep doing that. Keep pursuing your, your spouse, loving them, serving them, having a ball. In Jesus' name, all right? So, so listen, the word seek sometimes is translated the thing I seek most, the NLT, or what I want or what I desire. So this morning I want to ask you, again, just measuring the, your heart, your heart's passion against this description, what are you chasing after? How greatly do you desire God. How much more of him do you want in your life? As we go on to read the rest of verse 4, we find that the kind of heart that makes God their greatest passion is it's, it's, it's described or, or, or captured in these three words, okay? Devoted, focused, and curious, all right? Devoted, focused, and curious. Look, look at uh, the, the next line. We see devotion. He, he says, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The house of the Lord was the place of worship. It was the place where God's glory was revealed to his people. And so David says, that's the place. I think about my own life and my own journey. Uh, just, just, just try to track with me if you can this morning, okay? I, I was born in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, UK Medical Center, but we lived at 167 Kelly Harris Road. I had to go back and ask my parents, like, hey, where were all these addresses? Okay, so 167 Kelly Harris Road. Then we moved uh, to Route 7 Trail Ridge Drive. We made another move to another community. We lived at 1000 Osage Drive, 1057 Homestead Point. In high school, we moved to 1500 Barley Way and 606 Magnolia Avenue. Then in college, 206 Kendall Hall, 512 West 15th Street. In seminary, graduate school, 19 Manley Hall, 36 Bostwick Hall. I got married, thank you, Jesus, and moved to 700 Ridge Top Way. And then we move to Boston, 55 Station Landing, 196 Cross Street, 215 High Street, 57 Cobb Street. Is anybody as tired as I am right now? <laughs> that's, that's 15 moves, 15 addresses. And what David is saying is this, give me one. Give me one. This is where I want to live. This is where I want to dwell and I want to never move. I want to live in God's presence. There's a devotion of the heart to say, God, wherever you are, that's what I, where I want to be. But then there is a, a focus. This is not just a devoted heart. It is a focused heart. Because what does he say? To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. To gaze is more than to look. When, when we, we gaze, we are looking, but it is looking that is locked in. I think about my son, Titus, my five-year-old son, our five-year-old son, Titus. Um, he loves sports, all right? I don't know where he gets that from, but he loves sports. And he wakes up in the morning. I wish I had his childhood because he wakes up in the morning, don't judge us, and, and he goes right to YouTube and he starts watching Celtics highlights 
from the night before. You know, they do these like long 12 minute, every cool play. And so he's watching like, hey, yo, Titus, it's time to eat some breakfast. So he's, he's walking from the couch and he's got his apple stick and he's about to bump into the chair and he's about to trip over the couch because like he cannot take his eyes off of the highlights. Gazing is looking that's locked in, but also listen to this. This is so good. Gazing is looking that moves to loving. When something is beautiful, it captivates us. Beauty captivates. Beauty inspires. Beauty delights. Beauty fills us with hope. And no one or nothing is more beautiful than God. Is your heart saying that today? Is If God is your greatest passion, you are saying there is no one or nothing that is more beautiful than my God. But it doesn't stop there. Not just with devotion, not just with focus, but the third characteristic of this heart is that it is a curious heart. And this last line is kind of difficult to understand because David says, I want to not just be in the temple and gaze on the beauty of the Lord, but I want to inquire. So in other words, this is what's happening. David is enjoying everything that he can experience of God, but he knows there is more. To to inquire means to meditate. It, It is to desire with increasing depth, to want to know and understand more about God. I love what A.W. Tozer said in his book, The Pursuit of God. He said, the glorious pursuit of the infinite riches of God neither has limit nor end. To have found God and to still pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. In other words, we, he, he has God, but it's, it doesn't seem to make sense. It, it, it's, it's a mystery that we can have God, but we can still have more of God. And how is that? It's because God is infinite in his nature. We never get to the end with God. Whatever you know about him, there's more for you to know. Whatever you have experienced, there's more for you to experience. And we might assume as we're zeroed in on this verse that Everything's going great for David. Oh, one desire. I just want to be where you are, God. I'm I'm your beauty and your, I want to, there's more for me. Everything must be great. But as we read in the psalm, everything was not great. In fact, everything was really, really, really difficult. Verse two, it talks about evildoers assailing David and adversaries and foes. In verse three, it says that there is an army encamped around him. Have you ever been there? Does it feel like at times that everything and everyone is coming against you? Verse 5, there is, it's called a day of trouble. The life that Jesus calls us to, the life that Jesus is worthy of, says, God, I'm coming after you and nothing is going to stop me. Nothing is going to stop. And so number one, let's make God our, let's make pursuing God our greatest passion. But then number two, here's why. Here's why. Let's make God pursuing, let's make pursuing God our greatest passion because God passionately pursues us. Verse eight captures this and verse eight captures the heart of our vision this year. You have said, seek my face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. God is inviting us. He's inviting you. God is the same thing that God said to David. He's saying to every one of us. We know this because Jesus showed up and he said what? Follow me. Be with me. Pursue me. Pursue what I'm pursuing. Live with me. Live for me. Seek me with everything you've got. And when, when this verse says, seek God's face, we might say, well, does God have a face? Like, what does that mean? 
And and the Bible sometimes speaks in anthropomorphic terms, okay? That's a fancy way of saying it uses human terms to help us understand and emphasize who God is. So we'll see things like, like in Isaiah 59 where it says that God's arm isn't too short to save and his ear is not dull of hearing. Or 2 Chronicles 16, 9, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to strengthen those hearts who are fully committed to him. And so when God says seek his face, what does he mean? How do we know someone? By seeing their face. God is saying, know me. Understand me, love me, spend time with me. And David's response is so simple and so important. He says, your face, Lord, do I seek. The NLT, I love, I love what it says. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. My heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. I hope you see here in verse 8, this is worship. God reveals, we respond. God invites, we answer and follow. 1 John 4.19 says this, we love, first greatest commandment, what? Love God with everything you've got. How? We love because he first loved us. And I want to tell you this morning, listen, when God touches your soul, it will light you up. When God grabs a hold of your heart and he he helps you understand his great love, it's that conviction about his pursuit of us that will lead us to an unyielding commitment, an unyielding commitment of our pursuit of him. And so I want you to think about the gospel for just a couple of moments. Listen to how Jesus has pursued us. Jesus pursued us. He left heaven, the glorious, perfect place. Jesus pursued us. He traveled to earth an impossible distance the human mind will never calculate. Jesus pursued us. He took on our humanity, our very flesh and bones, breakable, fatigable, pierceable. Jesus pursued us. He endured skepticism, ridicule, opposition, and assault. Jesus pursued us. He taught the masses, healed their diseases, touched lepers, blessed children, and dined with the despised. Jesus pursued us. He pursued us to the very end. He pursued us to death. The king was made a sport by the Roman centurions. They spat upon him, beat him, and mocked him with a robe of purple and a crown of thorns. Jesus pursued us. He was scourged with 39 lashes, taking the very flesh off his back. Then Jesus pursued us by walking up a hill outside of Jerusalem with a Roman cross on his back until he could carry it no more. They drove spikes through his hands and his feet. It was there that Jesus suffered, bled, and died. And why did he pursue us? He pursued us and died on that cross to take our sin upon himself and the judgment and wrath of God that we deserve, which refers to the just hatred of sin and all of its heinous effects that we experience every single day. Jesus pursued us. Jesus pursued us, taking our death to give us life. Jesus pursued us, tasting hell to give us heaven. And so I want to ask you, have you received his love? Do you you know the love of God in a personal way? Has his love changed you?
If not, let today be the day that you receive this gift of love and salvation through Jesus Christ. You see, we pursue God with a great passion because God has passionately pursued us. This is our vision for 2024. I want to read our vision statement for you. We gave you a card that, that, that will remind you of this uh, every day as you uh, maybe put in your Bible a place where you can see it and you can pray into it. But, but listen to what we've articulated as our vision statement for 2024. This is what we say. No pause exists in the pursuit of God. His relentless pursuit of us motivates our relentless pursuit of him. The love of Christ compels us. That's why we will enjoy increasing intimacy by building life-giving rhythms and prioritizing his voice above the noise. Do, Do you hear Psalm 27 in that statement? Do you hear the good news of the gospel that it is in light of his relentless pursuit of us that we are relentlessly pursuing him? And so how are we going to do that? Well, we we say what we're going to pray into and seek to live more and more and more is that we would prioritize his voice above the noise. And who knows that there is a lot of noise in our lives as Bostonians in 2024. Does anyone know that? Could you just like slip up your hand, nod your head, give me an amen. I mean, there is a lot of noise around here. Amen? There's a lot of noise. And so how are we going to deal with it? How are we going to prioritize his voice above the, 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 all the noise around us? Number one, we are going to turn down the noise of distractions. And sometimes they're only seven inches big. Amen? Turn down the noise. Bring the noise of our ever-changing and often discouraging circumstances to the Father in prayer. Turn down the noise. We're going to make sure that all of our other worthy pursuits that are good pursuits, that they fall under and get caught up in our worship of him, our greatest pursuit. And we by his grace, are going to recognize that there is no louder noise in our lives than the noise of our sin. The false desires that we have to chase after other things, to go our own way, to choose our own wisdom rather than the wisdom of God. We are going to kill it. We are going to fight against our sinful desires and inclinations and actions with everything we've got because I'm telling you, if you are not fighting against your sin, you are going to have a lot of noise in your life that drowns out the voice of your father as he is pursuing you. But not only that, we're going to build life-giving rhythms that will help us pursue God with everything we've got. I want to give four of those rhythms for you and then a fifth bonus one for REC in 2024, all right? Get ready. Here we go. All right, number one, we are going to learn ways to receive and rest in God's love. We're talking about prioritizing regular, even daily time with God, all right? And you say, oh, Pastor Tanner, I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, what does that mean? I'm just saying, like, you, you have lots of commitments and appointments, and I got to be at work, and I got to be at school, and I'm meeting this person, I got family, and we got dinner. And it's like, Jesus, start carving out. If you need to put it on your calendar, put it on your calendar. Some regular time just to meet with God to pray, to hear from him in his word. You say, I have no clue how to do that. That's why we are here to help you. On your way in, you receive this, what we call a Devo God. It's a devotional God that will walk you through a simple structure with tips. You don't have to use every idea, but ways that you can regularly spend time with God this year. You can go to rhc. Church. Way good. We good? R-H-C dot church forward slash Bible reading. We have this Devo guide as well as Bible reading plans there for you. Let's take a step to commit to spending time with God daily to rest and receive in his love. And if you, listen, if you need a little bit of motivation, I've got a a little bit 
for you this morning, all right? I have been married for 17.5 years. You can yeah, thank, thank you, somebody. Thank you. Uh, 17, let's go times three, times four, God. Keep us, you know. um, so, so before I got married, you may have come into my apartment and seen some dishes that had been in the sink for days, maybe a week. And you may have gone in my bedroom and found sheets that had not been washed in like 17 months. <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't that bad. This is what I'm remembering. I don't know. It's bad. It's bad. It's bad. Please don't judge me. Actually, you should judge me. It's fine. It's, it's, I deserve it. All right. So, <laughs> but then I got married. And now, listen, your boy actually enjoys doing the dishes. Your boy likes things clean now. Like, you know, Marcia was like, I could never understand when we first got married. It's like, why does she have to clean up everything? Now, it's fine. You may not be like, it's fine, whatever. But Marcia loves, like, the kitchen to be clean, everything put away. So when we wake up the next morning, everything is, like, good, it's peaceful, it's ready to go. And I could not understand why she was like that. But now, when I go to bed, I want everything clean in the kitchen. I want things put away. I'm even doing a better job these days putting away my dirty clothes, all right? Still pray for me on that. I'm working on it. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, from where I was 17.5 years ago to today, it's like I'm Mr. Clean. It's, it's, like, it's like your voice, Mr. Clean. I mean, I almost, I, almost have, I almost have cleaning companies trying to call me for endorsements now. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just crazy. I don't even understand it. But it's like... What happened? How did the transformation come? The more time I spent with her, the more time Marcia got into me. I promise you, I promise you, the more time you spend with God, the more God will get into you. Oh, please spend time with him. He loves you. He wants to spend time. He wants to pour more of himself into more of you. Number two, we are going to live as a house of prayer and worship. So here's our commitment as pastors, as leaders. We are going to put more strategic emphasis into our spaces of prayer, not only on Sundays and groups, but we have three ongoing prayer opportunities for us as a church family. Number one, fire nights, the first Friday of every month. Number two, pre-service prayer that happens at 9 a.m. before our service so we can pray that, you know, people can sing and preach and whatever, but like, is God showing up? And so we're praying in pre-service prayer every Sunday about what is about to happen. We're praying for you. You have been prayed for today because people are showing up to pre-service prayer at 9 a.m. And then number three, we have a midweek Zoom. It's super early, but super convenient, 6.30 a.m., but it's on Zoom. So here's the step. Choose one of those three opportunities and just show up a few times over the next four or five months. I think that's pretty accessible. Pick, pick. Pick fire nights, midweek Zoom, pre-service prayer, or some combination, and just pick a few times to participate over the next four or five months. And we're going to learn to increasingly become a house of prayer and worship. Number three, we want to practice the seven pursuits of a disciple. Listen, this is important. You're like, you're new to Redemption Hill. What's this church about? Okay, listen, we care about, hopefully, what we should care about. We, we care how many people are here on Sunday. That tells a story. That tells us something about what is happening in the life of our church. We definitely care about how many people are connecting with groups through the week and serving with our teams. And you hear us talk a lot about connect with a group, serve with a team. And there is no doubt, God, help us to care more and more and more about the number of people that are stepping into Faith in Christ and beginning their journey with Jesus, following him in baptism. We certainly care about all of that. But if you asked us, what, what is most, the most important measure of your church? It's actually a measure, measure that it's really hard to put a, 
a, a number on it. It's not very quantifiable. But it's, but it's this. How many of our people are actively growing in what we call the seven pursuits of a disciple? And I want to just read them for you real quick. I haven't memorized, okay? Seek God daily with passion and joy. Are you doing that? Surrender daily to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Share Jesus weekly with bold faith. These are pursuits, not perfections, not boxes to check. We're saying, like, if I can just point someone, if I can invite them to church, if I can just give them a Bible verse, like, I want to do that as often as I possibly can. Number four, spend time building healthy relationships with RHC family. Number five, serve with intentional love in the home, church, and city. Number six, sacrifice time and money to cultural idols. Amen? Yes, amen. With a lifestyle of generosity. And then number seven, spread God's mission by multiplying disciples. You will say, Pastor Tina, that's a lot. How am I going to take an action step here? All you need to do is get ready for the seven weeks after Easter. The, the Sundays in April and most of May, we are going seven weeks on the seven pursuits of a disciple on Sunday mornings and in our community groups, and we are going to teach you and to train you in how to live these out. Number four, we want to intentionally pursue others who need Christ. Listen, when we, when, when, we, when you make God your one thing, your greatest passion. I am confident that this is going to happen more and more and more in your life. Why? How? We will share God's love with others out of the overflow of the experience of that same love. It's our vision. It's our prayer that we will see dozens of people step into the life of Christ year after year. And some of you are like, dozens isn't that many. And some of you are like, that's crazy. That's a lot of people. I mean, dozens, if my math is right, it's at least 24. But could be 144. Like, the, 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 the number is in God's hands, but what is in our hands is pointing people to Jesus. And so we're going to do that with increasing focus together as a church as we live as a church on the move. The, the step for you here is this, and we've talked about this before, nothing new. Commit to pray for three people in your life. Just pray for them. And then, as God leads you, invite them to come to church with you. You can do more. You can give them a Bible. You can share the gospel. You can do whatever. But we're just saying, pray for three and then invite them to join you on a Sunday. And I would suggest use one of our kind of, quote, unquote, bigger Sundays where it's easier to invite people. We're talking about Super Sunday on, I think it's February 11th, or the, the Baptism Sunday is coming up on February 25th and April 21st, or especially, hello, Easter Sunday, March 31st. There are people in your life that is just, hey, if you're free, join me. I would love for you to come and meet some really, really amazing people and learn about the God I follow. And then there's one more pursuit. And this pursuit is not as important as all of the other pursuits, but it is very important for our mission as a church this year in 2024. We want to prepare to pounce on space as we together discern God's provision. Now, to be clear, this is, this is what we mean by that. Because we believe this is what is best for Redemption Hill. We want to do everything we can to acquire a 24-7 space that is not only good through the week, but it also will house us on Sundays. We love our community center in Medford Square, but it will not hold us on a Sunday morning. And so as pastors and leaders, and some of you are joining us, helping us, it's time to better prepare ourselves by finalizing our vision for this space, uh, completing environmental assessments, surveilling opportunities, and nailing down our funding plan. And we're going to share more about this as we move through the year in our members' meetings, even on Sundays. But this morning, what you need to hear from our pastors is this. We are much, much less concerned about Redemption Hill getting into a building than we are God getting into us. 
We, we're convinced that as, as we pursue God all the more, that that is what's going to propel us into this next season when God, we don't know the timing. It, we're not making any kind of promise that it's going to happen this year, but we want to prepare ourselves to take that step as God provides and leads us as we, what, together present discern God's provision. This isn't Pastor Tanner's decision. It's not going to be just the pastor's decision. We're going to take the lead, but it will be a congregational, yes, this is the direction that God is leading us. And so 2024 is the year of pursuit. And you might notice on the graphics, we have some simple, I teach kids every week, and it just hit me that, that these little hand signals might really help us remember and practice these pursuits. And so if you think they're kind of cheesy, listen, I don't care because I am here to help you follow Jesus. And I think this might help just a little bit. Okay, so as we pursue God out of his pursuit of us, number one, we want to learn ways to receive and rest in God's love. We want to receive. Number two, we want to live as a house of prayer and worship. Number three, we want to practice the seven pursuits of a disciple. And we want to point others, intentionally point others, who pursue others who need Christ. Intentionally pursue others who need Christ. And then finally, number five, prepare to pounce on space as we together discern God's provision. And so as we bring our time to a close, I want you to notice that our vision ends with a prayer. And I hope that you'll begin praying it. I hope you'll pray it often. It simply says this, God, thank you. That's always a great prayer, by the way. If you just pray those like three words, two words, thank you, thank you, thank you. God knows if you're talking to him, thank you. God, thank you for pursuing us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. By your spirit's power, we are joyfully running after you like you are joyfully running after us. And so we're going to move into a time of singing and time of prayer. And, and, and I just want to ask you where we started this whole message. Are you living with an unshakable conviction about God's pursuit of you? And if so... Are you ready to live? This is a real question, fam. Are you ready to live with an unyielding commitment in your pursuit of him? Because God has more for us. He has more. He has more of himself to give, and there is more of ourself to give him in response. And so let's pray together. Let's ask God to do this. God, we thank you for pursuing us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God, we are convinced that you love us. We are convinced that you have pursued us. And so, God, out of, out of this amazing love, God, would you help us to pursue you like never before? God, would you put a passion in our heart that we can't shake? God, would you fill us up with desire that says, hey, there are a lot of other important things that I have going on, but, God, there is nothing more important than you. Help us to carve out time to spend with you regularly. Help us to find ourselves in places of prayer where we can just enjoy gazing upon your beauty and inquiring in your presence. God, lead us in your love to those around us that we would intentionally pursue others who need to experience your love. God, we're excited. We know that you are going to move and respond and to lead us as we seek your face. And so God, we commit it all to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.